But I want to finish now, uh, having had that slightly more personal, um, if you like, middle section. I want to finish now by thinking more towards the end of the letter about, um, and really giving an extended answer to, I think it was Ben's question, why did Paul write Romans? Um, and I think, as I said in response to that earlier, I think it's only at the end of the letter that Paul almost reveals his hand, um, reveals why he had taken such a long time, in by comparison to other letters he wrote, such a long time to explain the gospel. Now, remember, Paul didn't plant this church in, in Rome. We're not sure who did. The Catholic Church is convinced that it was Peter. Uh, I'm not so sure, but who knows? It could have been other merchants uh, and traders after the day of Pentecost. But somehow this church in Rome was established apart from the Apostle Paul. So he's not the apostle to this church, the founding pioneer. So at one level, he writes a letter that is perhaps a little bit less um, circumstantial. When you read 1 and 2 Corinthians, you realize he's really firefighting uh, on several fronts. And therefore, you never get an extended explanation of the gospel because he's always responding to issues that are arising in churches that he feels responsible for. With Rome, that's different. And so you get a more sustained explanation of the gospel. So at one level, you could answer Ben's question, why did Paul write Romans? By simply those kinds of arguments that uh, it's a less particular or circumstantially driven letter because he wasn't the leader of that congregation or the founder and so he's just if you like explaining the gospel but i think with paul nothing's ever just for its own uh, nothing no, nothing's without motive he's always wanting to achieve something through what he's doing and towards the end of the letter i think it becomes clear that there were two things on his mind that weighed heavily one is unity and the other is mission. I think these are the two great purposes that were motivating Paul's letter to the Romans. And I wanted to just say a few words about both of these before giving time for some questions from you and then uh, and then some time for prayer. So the first is um, unity. And this becomes apparent from Romans 14 onwards. We started, if you remember, by looking at Romans 12. In view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as living sacrifices. He goes on then in that chapter, actually, to describe a generous life of redemptive love that will not allow hurt and um, mistreatment from others to re be returned with vengeance and revenge, but instead will leave room for God's vengeance and instead will show love to our enemies and to those who hurt us. So in what in Romans 12, he's already given a sort of early note that how we treat others that we disagree with or who we don't get on with is so important to what it means to living out this in Christ life. But it's in Romans 14 and 15, especially that the theme of unity comes to the fore in a much more obvious way. And uh, once again, I'll just um, share a couple of slides that hopefully will help us with this. Let me just get a big screen somehow. How do I do that? There we go. Here's some verses, just, just brief, just for time. I just chose a few highlights from 14 and 15. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. And then all of this goes towards an end, which he captures beautifully in 15.7, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the repetition there of the word one. He wants unity. He wants God's people in Rome to speak with one voice because they are thinking with one mind. Now, that's the unity. But notice with me that this is unity, not uniformity, right? This is unity, not uniformity, because in the verses above that, 14, 1 and 2, he says that we should not quarrel over disputable matters. And he goes on to describe those as issues like, some people think certain foods are 
okay to eat and others are unclean, particularly meat. Whereas other people think all meat is absolutely fine. Who's he got in mind? Well, he probably has in mind that within the church in Rome, there are Jewish people who have become Christians from a Jewish background, and there are Gentiles, non-Jews, Romans, Greeks, etc. And these two different cultures are clashing within the church, within the Christian church, within the different house churches. It's possible, in fact, that they're not just clashing, but they are slightly separating, that there are some house churches meeting in Roman villas that are non-Jewish in their makeup, and then others that are more Jewish, and they're almost separating, not talking to other to each other, suspicious of each other, because for the Romans, the Jews were just odd. They just couldn't understand these strange customs they had of kosher meat and circumcision and Sabbath laws, and they thought they were just strange. And just because people have become Christians doesn't mean that they don't find certain things about each other strange. Have you noticed this? It's quite possible to um, have uh, a, a genuine faith in Christ, but still feel like there's certain idiosyncrasies about each other that wind us up or make us feel a bit like we don't understand why each other reacts in the way we do. And these kinds of issues, perhaps multiplied by the way that the church in Rome was reflecting the culture in Rome, Jewish people tended to be more in a ghetto culture, separate from mainstream Greco-Roman society. That culture was invading the church and causing fault lines and division. And Paul was not happy with it. Notice he's not prepared to settle for the idea. Well, there are some churches that are more Jewish and some that are more Gentile. No, no, no. He says, I want you to be one that with one heart and one sorry, with one mind and one voice, you may glorify not two, but one. So unity, I think, is one of the answers to Ben's question. Why did Paul uh, write Romans? Now, notice here, and, and I pick this up with the unity, not uniformity point. Notice that Paul, on the issue of eating meat or only eating vegetables, on the issue of drinking alcohol or being teetotal, which is another thing that comes up, on the issue of Sabbath observance, one day of the week is still holy, or not seeing any day as special, which also came up. Notice with me, this is really important, Paul never calls it. He never decides the issue. He never says, here's the announcement. This one's right and that one's wrong. We should all eat meat or we shouldn't. We should all drink alcohol or we shouldn't. We should all keep the Sabbath or we shouldn't. He never gives the answer. Never gives the answer. He does describe some people as strong in their conscience and others as weak in their conscience, which is an indication of where he sat on the issues. But he never fundamentally says, Here's the right answer, and I want all of you to change so that you're all exactly the same when it comes to diet, <laughs> when it comes to your calendar. You've all got to be the same. Like I said, it's unity, not uniformity. And what Paul says in that passage that we just read is that these are, did you notice that phrase? He doesn't want us to quarrel over disputable matters. What do we imply from that? We take from that, I think. That for Paul, there are gospel matters and there are disputable matters. There are matters that are of primary importance and there are matters that are of secondary importance. And our unity is not based on agreeing on all of these things. Our unity as Christians is based on agreeing on the gospel matters, on the primary matters. Here's how I like to visually imagine this we've probably mostly got two hands and i like to think of it as a closed hand and an open hand right the closed hand is the gospel matters the gospel issues we've got to keep this hand closed because if we start opening up this hand and offering these things away as if they are secondary of importance we lose everything that it means to be christians <laughs> we lose the heart and soul of our faith in the closed hand then we need to keep this hand closed to say well, what has Paul said in Romans? We believe that Jesus Christ is God's son. He opened with that in Romans 1 verse 4, that he was declared with power to be son of God through his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, that's closed hand. 
that we're all sinners. Notice how Paul used the doctrine of sin. And this is what I mean about how he didn't kind of almost he didn't show us at the beginning what he was doing. But just subtly, he was building unity even when he explains sin. What does he say? There is no difference. Have you noticed that? Romans 3. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's as if even early on, he's just saying, I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing yet, but I just want you, I want you to see that it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. There's no difference. <laughs> We're all in the same predicament before God. So sin is in this hand. Salvation through the justifying, atoning work of Jesus. The spirit that we've been given. The spirit who makes us sons and daughters of, of, of our father in heaven. The spirit of adoption. The hope that we have at the return of Jesus, of a new creation. I'd say these things go in the closed hand. They are gospel matters. We can't afford to compromise on these things because this is our unity. But in the open hand, there are these other matters. Should a Christian drink alcohol or not? Is the Sabbath still a day that should be kept holy or not? How old is the earth exactly? <laughs> When will Jesus return and what particular events will precede that and follow that? What are exactly our male and female roles? Are they exactly the same? Are there some differences? When we take communion and, and baptism, what exactly is happening in those moments? You know, I would say personally that these belong in the open hand. We're not all going to agree on these things. You only have to read church history to realize that. And that's OK, because <laughs> our unity is not uniformity it is a unity that is gospel unity we are united in these things and these things are much bigger than anything that could divide us in this hand what we have in common in christ is much greater than the things that we might disagree over and so we act as one united in jesus based on gospel truths and we avoid quarreling over disputable matters now that doesn't resolve everything of course because the real dispute <laughs> is what do you put in the closed hand and what do you put in the open hand i wouldn't be surprised if that's where we're going to go in our questions in a moment when you want to ask what you think what what are what goes in this hand what goes in this hand is is probably more than anything else what is tearing the church apart right now particularly on questions of, of human sexuality but just leaving that aside for one moment what Paul is doing in Romans, why did Ben's question, why did Paul write Romans? He wrote it to build unity. He wrote it to say to the church, stop falling out over small matters and get united over the big things. <laughs> stop falling out over small things of personal difference, cultural difference, personality difference. Find your unity, rediscover your unity in the gospel. I think that is such an important message for the Christian church right now. It's so easy for us to fall out over secondary matters and as a result to lose our mission and impact over primary matters. We lose sight of the gospel because we're squabbling over other disputable matters. And Paul's saying, look, just leave those other things. You're not going to agree on those things and you don't need to. You can agree to disagree on the alcohol question. You can agree to disagree on the meat question. You can agree to disagree on the Sabbath question. But you, you find your unity in the Christ story, in the message of the gospel. That with one mind, notice the importance of this, it's a world that needs to hear God's people with one mind and with one voice glorifying the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So unity is the first big reason. I am... Um, I'm reminded of a story which I, I think I told in, in my book on Romans about uh, a time when my son and I went um, up a mountain in the Lake District and we stayed out overnight um, and we were coming down the next morning and we were coming over the ridge and we were coming down and we could see the car and the road that we would parked on beneath us. But it was tiny. Have you ever had one of those moments where the cars look like toys? You know, they're so small beneath you. And we could see the cars and we sat down to have a bit of a rest, eat some sandwiches before we descended the ridge. And as we sat and watched, two cars approached a humpback bridge from either side. And they both went up onto the bridge and met in the middle and stopped. And they locked, you know, locked onto the bridge. And soon we could hear horns sort of honking. But 
from where we could hear them, they sounded like sort of postman pat noises. You know, it just it was all and, and neither was prepared to reverse off the bridge. Mm. And it was this almost it felt comical to us to see this fallout <laughs> over something as petty as who's going to reverse from a humpback bridge. But the reason it felt so comical to us is because we were at this elevated place. You know, it was like in view of all of this, look at this incredible mountain range and the beauty of the Lake District. In view of all of this, are you really going to fall out over that? And I think this is how Christian unity works for Paul. In view of God's mercy. Are we really not going to speak to each other because she did this or he did that? You know, in view of God's mercy. Are we really going to speak badly of each other and criticise other people who don't align with everything we think? No, no, no. We need to stop quarrelling over secondary matters and recover our unity in the gospel. Now, why is that important? Well, because the second reason why Paul wrote Romans, unity, and the second, I think, is mission. Paul wants the church in Rome to join forces with him. He's planning a visit to Rome in order to reach further further afield with the gospel. Paul is coming to Rome with a determination to take the gospel beyond Rome um, to uh, Spain, actually. And so he says this in Romans 15. Uh, now, after I have completed this task, I'll tell you about that in a moment, and have made sure that they have received this contribution. I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. Paul then is ambitious for the gospel. He is never settling with what he's done, but he's always pushing on to what he describes as new horizons, new frontiers for the gospel. In this case, Spain, beyond Rome, the Western uh, hemisphere the western frontier of the of the roman empire and so mission is the other motivating force to the letter he wants to arrive in rome to find that the church is not ashamed of the gospel and so he writes this letter to remind us of the gospel and why we have nothing to be ashamed of the whole message is basically charged with a, an intention that God's people in Rome would be as confident in the gospel as Paul is when he writes it in Corinth. Not ashamed, but recognizing that our world, despite, as, and here's where we return to where we started, despite all of its impressive sophistication and achievements, you know, since Paul wrote Romans, we've, human beings have landed on the moon, we've invented the smartphone. If you travel in an airplane, you can have Wi Fi at 30,000 feet. Humans are incredible. We can do some amazing things, but we are no better off, <laughs> spiritually speaking, than we were when Paul wrote Romans. There is no further progress on, on the human attempt to overcome death. Have you noticed this? <laughs> we're no further on. Everyone's dying as much as they ever were. Everyone needs hope and truth as much as they ever did. Paul is therefore mobilizing God's people for mission by writing Romans. That's the second reason he wrote it, to build unity. And secondly, to build confidence in the gospel that we might, along with Paul, say, in the, in, in the face of all that our culture parades as significant, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, but also to the Gentile. Now, Paul has plans then to visit them in Rome, and he plans to come. Did you notice that phrase? He plans to come in the, he says that when I come, I'm certain that I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. I wanted to finish my, my bit with you by just telling you what actually happened, because I find the difference between what Paul was planning to happen and what through the book of Acts we know actually happened. The difference between these two is, is illuminating. Um, and it sheds light particularly on, Paul's actual conviction in the gospel because it's one thing to write a letter like Romans and say that you're confident in the gospel and say that God works all things together for good and say that nothing will separate me from the love of Christ it's one thing to write a letter saying that it's another thing to live it out when life isn't working well for you wouldn't you say <laughs> it's one thing to say it it's another thing to live it in Romans the letter Paul says it while he's in Corinth 
But by the time he actually arrived in Rome, he was having to live it uh, by faith. You see, even when we are committed to mission, even when we are determined to be living sacrifices who are set apart for God's purpose in our lives, even when that's our commitment, it doesn't guarantee that things will be easy. In fact, more than that, even when we have a plan, it doesn't mean that life will go to plan. Paul had a really clear plan. And it didn't go to plan. Does that encourage you slightly? Even the great apostle Paul had a tremendous plan and then nothing worked out according to the plan. (laughs) Let that encourage you. If that can happen to Paul, it's not a surprise that it can happen for us as well. See, what actually happened, let me go back to the screen and talk you through this, because what actually happened was he says in the verse that I just put up on the screen that he um, that he after I have completed this task and have made sure they have receive this contribution i will go to spain and visit you on the way what he means that what he's referring to is that he wants to go to jerusalem first before coming to rome because he's raised money for the poor christians in judea by the way isn't that interesting that paul wasn't just about preaching the gospel he was also involved in if you like humanitarian aid raising money this particular trip wasn't a preaching tour it was uh, a, a, about Trans- taking money uh, to help people who were poor so the gospel is about for paul was not just about preaching it but also demonstrating it in word and in action anyway when he went to jerusalem um he was arrested in the temple because he was accused of bringing gentiles there falsely accused into the holy place he was arrested um they tried to kill him the jewish people when they realized it was paul who'd been causing trouble for them all over the world the romans rescued him from an assassination plot and they took him to Caesarea Maritima which is just north of Tel Aviv today and there they put him in prison and it there's this little verse in in Acts where Luke says two years later you know uh, he he has one trial and then it's two years later he was called to another trial and it's just, just you just think about that the great apostle Paul stuck in prison for two years with seemingly nothing to do and nothing happening You know, not exactly the plan. He was meant to be in Spain by now and he was rotting away in prison. Well, eventually he's released or not released. Eventually he appeals to Caesar and he's put on a ship to Rome, but under armed guard to deliver him to Caesar to see whether Caesar will decide as a Roman citizen whether he should live or die. But at least the plan is back on track. They're now sailing to Rome, only off Malta, the ship hits a storm. The whole boat is destroyed. They're all in the water fighting for their lives. They make it onto the shore only to find that as Paul puts a log on the fire, a viper jumps out, locks onto his arm and and a but, but for God's grace would have poisoned him. And at that point, you just think two years in prison, shipwrecked off Malta, snake bites on the island. Paul must have sort of looked up and thought, God, what have I done? You know, what's going wrong? What, everything that he'd planned wasn't going to plan. My point is, by the time he actually arrived in Rome, having told him in this letter, look at this verse, I know when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. Having told them that in the letter, he now arrives on death row under lock and key, fearing for his very life. And it would be fair to say, so does he now believe all that he preaches? You know, when you're in that sort of situation, are you able to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel? When you're on death row, are you able to say God works all things together for good? When you're facing the end, are you able to say nothing will separate me from the love of Christ? Well, the answer in Paul's case is yes. He absolutely practiced what he preached because you can visit today. Can you see this picture off to the side? That's why I'm leaving the screen on. Can you see this picture of a hole coming down through the roof? This is in what's known as the Mamertine prison and some of the Romans course uh, that, that you can do in your small group. We filmed it in this in this dungeon. And this is almost certainly where Paul was held right at the end of his life before he was executed in around 67 AD. He was being lowered down through that hole. And it's probably in this dungeon where he wrote to Timothy and uh, sat towards the end of his life. Um, But that plaque, can you see the plaque on the wall just beneath the hole? I was fascinated by this plaque because in Latin it commemorates. Here's the thing. It commemorates all of the 
soldiers, the Romans Praetorian guards, all of the soldiers who became Christians while they were guarding the Apostle Paul. <laughs> Do you get the point? Even in prison, Paul would not stop sharing the good news of Jesus. In fact, he assumed that even when his plan did not go to plan, God had a plan. God was working things for good, like he promised he would, that these people that were guarding him on four hour watches, they were now Paul's captive audience. And he shared the gospel with them. And some of them came to faith as that plaque commemorates. I love this about Paul. You can put him anywhere, but he, you cannot stop him sharing the good news of Jesus. God works even through the setbacks. Even when our plan does not go to plan, God has a plan. Do I hear an amen? <laughs> I don't because you're all on mute, but I, I feel like I do. Um, you know, even when our plan does not go to plan, God has a plan. And out of that conviction, Paul would say, I think he would say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. You know, if I'm on trial before Caesar, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I'm going to talk about him all the way to the end. Nothing's going to stop us sharing this good news of Jesus. And my prayer for us, secure in Christ, you know, back to this little fella. Paul understood himself, even in that Roman prison, to be in Christ, unshaken, unmoved by circumstances, never backing down from being a witness to Jesus Christ. My prayer for all of us is that in Christ, whatever circumstances we face, we would never stop sharing the good news about Jesus. Amen. Well, that brings us into land. Um, I wonder if I'd love to just pray for you before we before we absolutely finish. But I wonder if there's any questions or comments that you have. I think I'd say I want I would probably want to expand things out. Let me flip it around and say more what 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 how do we know what's a primary matter? Because everything else would I think would be secondary. But what's a primary matter? I think it's got to be firstly gospel matters. And they are clearly outlined in Romans up until this point really and i went through some of those and you can tell that they're gospel matters because uh, they are narrated by paul as in the emphatic sense that they are true for everyone and true at all times and and when you find him in galatians for example so angry at people who are forsaking the gospel you realize that quite different tones of language are used by paul when he is addressing gospel matters to when he's addressing secondary matters um, the, the, the point that perhaps needs to be made, though, is there are gospel matters, but because the gospel message about Jesus is housed within a larger story of Scripture, arguably there are also creation matters, not just gospel matters. There are matters rooted back in the story, and the gospel presumes on that story in making sense of itself. So obviously matters of human sexuality i wouldn't call them gospel matters they're not intrinsic to the message about the risen jesus but they are creation matters intrinsic to the story that underpins the message about jesus and that's part of the challenge of thinking this through it would be rather neat for us if there was a section where paul had um outlined all of the primary matters I don't think he does. I think he under, yeah, it, there are sections and 1 Corinthians 15 is the most obvious where he says, I want to remind you, brothers, of the things of first importance. Hmm. And then he goes on to say Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day. Gospel matters. But I think we probably need to add to the list of gospel matters. We also need to add, uh, add <laughs> creation matters. Uh, and that's where the human sexuality thing um, is perhaps best defined. And I'd like to pray. Uh, some verses in Romans over us, which I think are just a wonderful, uh, almost conclusion to the letter uh, in Romans 15. Very famous verses. Paul says this in verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I pray for all of us that whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, knowing that we are secure in Christ, we would overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit and that that hope would overflow from us to a world around us that desperately needs the good news of Jesus. Like the Apostle Paul, even when our plans don't go to plan, thank you that you have a plan. May we never stop 
sharing the good news of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Lord, we thank you that your word is true. We thank you that we have security in Christ. We thank you that our faith is unshakable and unmovable. We thank you for that hope that we have in you that is steadfast and certain. And may we have confidence in the gospel in all times and in all situations. And may we be not ashamed of the gospel, the truth that we have in you. So, Lord, we thank you for the richness of this morning, the depth that we have um, delved into and the riches and the truths that we have learnt. Help us, Lord, to share them with clarity and conviction with others and help us, each one of us, to go deeper into you. And so I just want to read a few words from Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So picking up from Marion's prayer, let me read um, the final few words of Paul's letter to the Romans, with which he signs off and uh, we'll sign off our morning together. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with the gospel, the message Paul proclaimed about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith to the only wise God, be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen.